Yeah, this is the story of Donald Trump's performance here, I think, in Virginia tonight. It's not really in this northern Virginia area. You see Hillary Clinton. This is Loudoun right now, about a 22,000 vote lead, pretty much on course with what Barack Obama got four years ago. I mean, the story for Donald Trump, it's just, it's these rural areas. It's these, you know, small red counties that just, you know, big turnout, giant Trump supporting them. And we can show you some down here. Look at this, you know, 82% yeah, tiny that's... rural county. But that's, that's, that's what you're looking at powering this thing. Yeah, I don't want this word excerpt to become a thing. This is out in the country. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have an expression for this, and this is the vote out in the Southwestern country. Southwestern Virginia is its own thing. Where it's we've seen country. all the Trump signs yeah. for weeks and weeks and weeks and all summer long. So. Yeah. The, Nicole Wallace. Nicole Wallace. Wallace. You're the yeah. You have to say for yourself. No, listen, I, I, I feel like I was wrong. I mean, this is really a tight race, and the Clinton campaign projected a lot more confidence than has been reflected in the way the evening has gone down so far. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter what happens, uh, Trump had a lot more support in a lot more states among a lot more people than the polls detected uh, after this morning. Mm -hmm. I am told Lawrence O'Donnell uh, has more from the insiders. Lawrence? We're here with Steve Schmidt and uh, James Carville. James, I've seen you worried from time <laughs> to time. I've never seen you more worried than any about anything than you were worried about Virginia. How are you feeling now? Well, I feel much better. Uh, the party chair that I've been in contact with, and she's watching with the governor, and it, it, it's moving better because if we lost Virginia, we, we, we probably were going to lose. So that, that I feel much, much better about Virginia. Uh, but you know, and, and what Chris said about Pennsylvania is encouraging. Uh, I think all eyes going to be on North Carolina now. Steve, yeah. North Carolina. Yeah, for sure. Um, and. Uh, and uh, she's behind in North Carolina. Look, I, my prediction was 320 to 340 electoral votes for her. I'm clearly wrong on that. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a very long night. It's going to be close. And you look at the rural vote that's coming in in Florida. I don't think these things happen in isolation. So as we move into Ohio, we move into Michigan, we're going to see this phenomenon play out. But this is this the, the presidency is up for grabs. Clearly, that's what you hour. keep saying in our ongoing conversation here that the audience hasn't been a part of right. is that this doesn't happen in in isolation. Right. Talk about Michigan. Well, what can well we I mean, if, if, Michigan if you have all this turnout in, in, in North in North Florida, if you have all this turnout in, in, in North in North Florida, if you have all this turnout in, in rural Virginia, if you have all this turnout, it, it, it's going to bleed over into Michigan. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's very hard for me to see a scenario. I hope I'm wrong. I, I desperately want to be wrong. I'm not in the business of being <laughs> a, to be right here tonight. But I, I, it, it worries me about Michigan. Uh, in you know, we're getting we're getting to the point here. Yeah, they have several passed to 270, but we're getting to the point where some of them are getting cut off. I, I was, you know, much more optimistic about Florida, obviously, but you know, well, I mean, I still a very good chance that, that she'll be the next president. But you know, I would say to Democrats watching this, don't don't tune out yet. Uh, Steve, a chance that she'll be the next president? Yeah, for sure, there's a chance she'll be the next president, but it's a lot closer than anybody expected. Certainly, in all our line of work. Brian, we're going back to you for poll closings. That uh, quote from Steve Schmidt will uh, find a life uh, of its own tonight. The presidency is up for grabs. We just heard it there on live television. Uh, both uh, Mr. Carville and Mr. Schmidt um, exercising a whole lot of caution. The American people have a funny way of making sure they get heard, and they are being heard tonight. Uh, 10 o'clock hour is uh, five seconds away. Here we go. States here. This In is gold, be there they are. Here are the closings this hour. It is 10 p.m. in the state of Iowa. Our call for right now is too close to call. In the state of Nevada, our call for this hour is too close to call. In the state of Utah, and remember, favorite son in the race, three-way, too early to call, Clinton, Trump, McMullen. In the state of Montana, the Big Sky State goes to Donald Trump. So that red band, that red wall continues its trek west with the time zones. Here's the electoral race, 140-104. Here is the electoral, here are the too close to call states, Florida of the battlegrounds, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Georgia, Michigan, all of these too close to call, North Carolina, 
81% in. Virginia, we've talked a lot about Virginia this last Look hour. How close. <laughs> Minnesota, 12% of the raw vote in. New Hampshire and Maine, too early to call. Here we go, Arizona, 11 electoral votes. Missouri, Trump in the lead, too early to call. Wisconsin, Colorado, and New Mexico. Let's pan down to the ice and bring up the map. Blue and red on Democracy Plaza. Here's your country so far. The states we've been able to call as the time zones head from east to west. You can see the big states we are waiting for. Utah is such an interesting uh, case study, and not even a case study. So Utah is its own case, its own standalone politics and dynamics this year. If Evan McMullen is able to win um, the state of Utah tonight, and our, again, our call right now is that Utah is too early to call, and it is a three-way race between Trump, Clinton, and McMullen. If he wins Utah, that would be the first time a third-party candidate or an independent candidate gets electoral votes since George Wallace, right? 1968? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, I mean, if he can actually win that state, there's obviously Evan McMillan is not going to win the presidency, but if he wins that state in Utah, that'll be its own kind of history. Um, but it is striking to see both Iowa and Nevada at this point as too close to call. It could also throw the race into chaos if we come yeah. down to a place where neither of them can get to 270. That's his right. win, if he wins, his win in Utah could be what blocks either one of them from getting With to those six electoral votes, though, there's also two potentially faithless electors out of the state of Washington, which is expected to go for Clinton, but two Bernie supporting electors in Washington have suggested that I love the phrase out of it. Faithless, Faithless. Faithless electors. Yeah. electors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Steve Kornacki at the board once again, and this time it's Michigan, Michigan. Steve. Starting to get returns from Michigan. Obviously, this is a state very late in the campaign. The Trump campaign said, we're going to put this on the map. The Clinton campaign started playing defense. What can we tell you? Pretty early here in the returns. Couple things to point out. First of all, we talk about this college, non-college white gap. I said there's two counties in Michigan that tell this story writ large for the entire country. Let me show you what's happening in both of them right now. First of all, this is Oakland County. This is the sort of quintessential college-educated white voter county. It is a big suburb. It is affluent, economically upscale. Most of the vote, maybe even all the vote, is now in. Hillary Clinton, you see, she's winning it. She's winning it by eight points. This is basically the same margin Barack Obama got out of Oakland County. This hey, Steve, I've got to interrupt you. We have a call. Uh, this projection, New Mexico is going to Hillary Clinton. Hmm. Remember the hubbub when uh, Donald Trump uh, showed up in New Mexico a few days before the election? Everyone said, what do they know? What do they know? Both parties, what do they know? Here's the uh, electoral map, 140-109, with New Mexico now. Five the electoral votes there, yeah. That will give them a patch of blue to the west of Texas. So there's your map. Mr. Kornacki, please continue. Apologies. No problem. I understand. So we are talking about Oakland County. This is sort of, this is the heart of the college-educated white voter. This is the big college-educated white voter county in Michigan. And you see, mostly in right now, Hillary Clinton's won it. Used to be a Republican county. Now Clinton wins by eight points. But we said keep an eye right next door tonight on another giant county outside Detroit. That is Macomb County. Macomb County is where that term you hear in politics, Reagan Democrat, comes from. This place went for Reagan in the 80s. It swung back to the Democrats. Barack Obama won it. These are blue-collar white voters. Check out what's happening. It's early in Macomb County. Barack Obama won this county four years ago. Barack Obama won this county eight years ago. Democrats said all those stories about us struggling in Macomb County, they're a thing of the past. Well, check this out. Donald Trump, it's early here. He's leading by 20. This matches what polling showed, though, in the run-up to this election might happen in Macomb County. This is a county that's going to churn out at least 400,000 votes tonight. Donald Trump, if this holds, this is a major shift within the state of Michigan. This is a big reason why his campaign decided to target this state. Now, if you're a Democrat, you still have some counties that are yet to come in. We can take a look at Wayne. This is where Detroit is. It's not just, De just Detroit. You'll end up seeing about 800,000 votes come out of here. This will end up probably going Clinton's way in a big way. Also, right next door, this is where the University of Michigan is. College town, very liberal. A lot of votes still to come there. One quick thing we can point out, too. Where did Hillary Clinton go?
when she went into Michigan. She went right outside Grand Rapids. She delivered a speech that was all about her relationships, friendships, willingness to work with Republicans. She was trying to make inroads in Republican Michigan. This county four years ago, Mitt Romney got 68 percent. Clinton spoke there yesterday. You see, it may have made a tiny impact, but 63 percent for Trump there right now. Steve, Steve Kornacki, Kornacki. Can, can I just ask you one quick question, Steve? Just oh, hang sorry. on. I got a Excuse projection. Me. NBC News is projecting that when all the votes are counted, Donald Trump will be the winner in Missouri. Ten electoral votes. Another piece in the Midwest and another patch of red. The race to 270 looks like this. 150, 109. Let's look at Missouri on the map. Thank you. Steve Kornacki, can I ask you one impressionistic question in terms of what you've been watching tonight? No, I can't. Oh. You there, I'm Steve? here. Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was hiding behind a pillar. If you could repeat the question, I'm sorry. Here's my question. As you have been watching these returns come in, as you have been tracking these county by county results, as we've been looking at these dozen states now that are too close to call, roughly, are you seeing anything where the polling seems like it was flat wrong, where the polling seems like it was radically uh, off in terms of what we're seeing tonight on election night? Yeah, I, I don't know radically. I mean, when you think about it, Florida, it, it looked like Clinton was leading steadily in the polls by two, three points. And probably if you averaged them together, it looked like she had a slight advantage there. We knew Florida four years ago was the closest state on the map. It was decided by less than a point. So when you're looking at how close it is right now, it's not a radical difference. It's not like there's a miss there by 10 points. But I think the accumulation of all those polls in Florida, for that matter, North Carolina, you started adding them up and it just looked like Hillary Clinton had a small but steady steady lead in those states. So those are closer. I think Virginia, the fact that Virginia is as close as it is, I think that ends up being a surprise. There were a few polls late there that showed that thing might be closing. But I mean, I think there was an expectation, a pretty broad expectation among politics people two weeks ago that Virginia could even be a double digit win. There was that idea that it was Tim Kaine's home state and that demographically, those college educated white suburbanites in the northern Virginia suburbs, they were just coming to dominate even a little bit in the suburbs around Richmond. But again, there is that equally strong message that's being delivered tonight by white voters in sort of rural areas, exurbs. They are coming out in big numbers. You're taking, and you, you've been talking about this, they're taking counties we knew were red. They're making them redder tonight. Steve Karnacki, thank you very much. Super helpful in terms of that context. Uh, Chris Matthews. When you look at Michigan historically, it shouldn't be such a shock that it might go for Trump because there is a history of very conservative white voting in Macomb County. Oh, yeah. Uh, George Wallace won the 1972 mm. Democratic, mm -hmm. you know, Gene, won that yeah. uh, primary out there. Democrats, which includes a lot of African-American mm -hmm. voters. So even with that uh, shift, I mean, that minority role, it is a conservative area. I think we make a mistake thinking the South's all south of here. Uh, a lot of it's mixed around. And I think uh, oh, that contiguous map we're looking at is how However, very powerful. I think we are increasingly a bicoastal, a country that sees itself as a bicoastal progressive part of the world and a, a very, not necessarily isolationist, but very traditional center of the country and conservative and white, if you will. And especially the prairie states. Look at them up there, the plain states, mm -hmm. the Dakotas, all those states. They just go Republican. A lot of this map, in all fairness, could have been filled in a couple of months ago. It's the one, the interesting thing is the states that we're following tonight are the ones we've been wondering about for months. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're yeah, pretty right. much where we were months ago in mm -hmm. terms of knowing how yeah, this is going. It's genuine. What's it's interesting is, <laughs> what is interesting is it's very cloying. It's very teasing. It's not telling us the answer. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, yeah. all we're getting is what we knew when we went in. Now, the interesting race, of course, are the Senate races where you saw, as you pointed out before you got on mm -hmm. the eight tonight, the Indiana race. It's really a, a blowout mm -hmm. for, yeah. for the for Todd the Young beating the, the up. Yeah. A great mm -hmm. name, by the way, for a newcomer, Todd Young, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. running against a well-known Evan Bayh, who was a longtime politician popular figure in that state elected his father was a senator he was governor he was a senator he, he could have stayed there forever had he stayed there exactly and they just decided his He'd you left. know he was past his sell-by date right he was, just wasn't <laughs> you don't go you away know. and come back home exactly. and say i've been he away was, and i think of. that's a fact i think we're interesting but also tonight we don't know who's going to run the senate as a friend of mine pointed out today uh we have three branches of government at stake tonight later tonight we'll know that the presidency Mm -hmm. The United States Senate and the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court. 
all of them lie before the American people's tabulations tonight, between now and hopefully when two in the morning, when we sort of begin to think it's time to take a, a nap at yeah. least. Can so I, I think it's a fact. To me, I love this because I love exciting close races. I hope uh, there's clarity. I hope there is a concession speech by the loser. I hope the American people go to bed and say, at least we have an electoral system that works, that's clean, it's trustable, it's not rigged. And in the end, we had an exciting race, which, as surprising and as disturbing as it was, had a conclusion. I think the idea that Michigan is not in reach for Republicans is one that people forget when you come down to the final stretch. Michigan is always in the game plan on a traditional campaign, and George W. Bush spent a lot of time campaigning mm. in the upper mm -hmm. Good reminder. Which, yeah. you know, Michigan is always available to you in the beginning, and then depending on the contours of the race, depending on how you're doing in the battlegrounds, you simply have to make choices. It's like Pennsylvania and New Jersey for mm -hmm. Republicans. You always put it on your wish list because of the nature of, of the people who live there. They do have a lot of traditional values in common with traditional Republican mm -hmm. candidates. So this, again, is exactly what Donald Trump should have been doing if he'd had a yeah. traditional campaign right. all along. If he'd had a traditional campaign all along, he would have been there. Ken Melman, who was George W. Bush campaign chairman, had a metric for touching these states and these kind of voters every 10 or 12 days. You know, So so if he wins, he will have done it despite. And how would you, put, wish, how would you put Michigan and Wisconsin on that in terms of, I mean, Wisconsin I, I, I literally was on a bus tour through both. I mean, yeah. I ate I custard, which they call ice cream. Another thing, a living memory of how great it was. In Pennsylvania, the steel cities of western Pennsylvania, like right, the Keysport, places like that where the cities boomed, and every guy coming out of World War II had a job yeah. coming out of World War II. White guys, mainly, but a lot of jobs out there. In Detroit, Motor City, it Motown. Was a city of two million people, broke for two million people. It was a boom was, town. It was, it was just an we made them cars for the world. The we made steel the for the world in Pennsylvania. We were yeah. the center of the universe in terms of manufacturing. Yeah. These people all remember that, and they want it back. And now, Trump talked about Trump it from the beginning of his primary run. Nirvana back to you. Exactly. Yeah. That's what that's what he said. Um, that's what he promised. How he could possibly deliver that, no one knows. But that, that was the promise. I do wonder, though, whether um, a, a more conventional Donald Trump running a more conventional campaign would have done as well as this Donald Trump running this campaign. We'll never I mean, know. We'll never know. Anyway, What's your answer? So. I think not, actually. He would have lost in the He would have lost in the primary. He would have <laughs> lost to Donald Trump, right? I mean, he, you know, there was... He... he he hit a nerve at the right moment with this sort of, uh, unconventional is not the word for it, in, at times crazy um, <laughs> approach to campaigning. He, he could have reined it in after becoming the nominee, but I know we well, have yeah. him, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Fine-tuning Donald Trump. Fine -tuning. We have two, <laughs> two pieces of business. We have a Senate call in North Carolina. Burr. Uh, is our projected mm. victor mm. in the Senate race decision. in North Carolina. This is a tough, I actually tough, thought tough race. this would go later tonight. Uh, Richard Burr, the projected winner. And over to Steve Kornacki for some new math out of Florida. Let's take a look at Florida. We've been saying, what's the gap Hillary Clinton has to overcome as these final votes come in? Well, it remains steady. Look where we stand right now. Hillary Clinton, about 136,000 votes. That's the window we've been in for a long Long time now, and frankly, she's running out of places on this map to find 136,000 votes. The big hope for Democrats has been the Gold Coast, the big three Democratic counties down here in the southeastern part of the state. I'll show you, though, there does not seem to be much vote left out in these places. Let me start with Broward. That is the biggie. Uh, seven, about 755,000 votes were cast in Broward County four years ago. That was a high turnout election, 755. You see, they've blown past that number here. doesn't mean they're all in. There are some left. There are not not a lot left, I don't think. Also, Palm, Palm Beach County, 600,000 votes were cast here. You can see, again, they've blown past that. Miami-Dade County, uh, it was 875. You can see they are well past that. There is big Democratic turnout in these places, uh, and Hillary Clinton's getting the margins Barack Obama did, maybe even a little more. But there is enormous turnout in Republican areas of this state as well. There also might be a little vote left up here. Volusia County, think Daytona Beach. This was dead even. Four years ago, Mitt Romney won this thing by a hair. Donald Trump has turned.
turn this into a double digit win and also the turnout is much higher. Let me show you this overall statewide turnout in Florida. If you add these numbers together, you're over 9 million. You're north of 9 million. You're probably sitting at about 9.2, 9.3 million if you add them all together. Keep that in mind as I show you what the results were four years ago. We thought this was high turnout. Look at this. You were sitting back when you add all the third party candidates together about eight and a half million in Florida four years ago. So that is considerably higher turnout. Democratic organization, Democrat turnout, those big counties, a big story tonight. Republican turnout is too. Maria Teresa Kumar is with us here in the studio, CEO of Voto Latino. Maria Teresa, I wanted to get your take on the, the Florida numbers Steve just walked us through. Well, one of the things I would be looking at right now is how many of those Republicans basically split their ticket. We know that roughly about 100,000 of them split their ticket for Hillary Clinton, but then went down ballot for Marco Rubio, securing his win. So of those individuals that are left over, I'm curious to see how many people, and I would look specifically me speaking about Republican women that decide to vote for Hillary, but then went down ballot. All right, Maria Teresa Kumar, thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will update all of the pending races, including the one you see there, North Carolina, with 83% of the vote in, too close to call, followed by Michigan, and the list we have almost committed to memory by now. When everything is designed around you, the driver, you can. The new Mazda 3. Daddy, let's play! Sorry, kids. Feeling dead on your feet? I've been on my feet all day. Dr. Scholl's massaging gel insoles have a unique gel wave design for outrageous comfort that helps you feel more energized. Dr. Scholl's, feel the energy. Hot dog. Seen it? Covered it. We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. Ben Fed's got great breeds for Madison. And great braids for Washington. PenFed's got great braids for everyone. At PenFed Credit, we've got great mortgage rates for homeowners all across America. Get the great rate you deserve, wherever you are. Wherever you are. Great braids for Buzzers Bay. And great braids for San Jose. PenFed's got great braids for everyone. Apply today at PenFed.org. This fall, the most popular magazine in the world is bringing the most compelling crime stories to life on Investigation Discovery. I just want to talk to my sister. I can't even do that. A 10-month-old girl was reported missing. My heart sank, and I just knew. These are the stories that changed everything. The entire world was heartbroken. We bring viewers closer to these stories than anybody else can. People Magazine Investigates. All new, Mondays at 10. Only on Investigation Discovery. Let's talk about early voting. Does that tell you something about energy and attitude? If you were watching tonight, you could have known he went home for a little while because he used the word attitude <laughs> on the air, <laughs> on this television. <laughs> talked about Brian, someone's you know. attitude. <laughs> Brian. We are back. Uh, we have a major call coming out of the vote. We'll try to get it up there, and it is Ohio. Donald Trump, the projected winner in the state of Ohio. 18 electoral votes, a hugely important piece of real estate where that comparison is concerned. 168-109 in the race to 270. Here's where it looks like, uh, this is where it looks like as a uh, color filling in the red alongside Indiana to the west of Pennsylvania, down on through West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and so on. Ohio and Iowa had been the two traditional swing states that the Clinton campaign felt like were, uh, or the Trump campaign felt like were most within their grasp. 
Iowa and Ohio consistently have been polling in ways that have been favorable to Donald Trump. Obviously, Ohio is the archetypal uh, battleground, but I think everybody's been feeling like it was leaning toward him. Still, that's got to shake the Clinton confidence even more than these other close races do right now. I just I do want to point out one thing about uh, North Carolina, which we are watching so intently right now. Again, North Carolina is one of these states that is too close to call, and it has been so for a very long time. Even right now, with 83 percent of the vote in, it is still too close to call Trump in the lead. But I, we were talking a little bit earlier on about the other two big ticket races. Races in North Carolina. One of them, this Senate race, Richard Burr, incumbent Republican senator, trying to hold on to his seat against Deborah Ross, who ran a good campaign against him. Burr is now the projected winner of that seat. He will hold on to that seat. The other big ticket item in North Carolina is the governor's race. And it's been fascinating to watch these governor's numbers come in out of this governor's race in North Carolina. Right now, again, with 84% of the vote up, it is too early to call. Too early to call in North Carolina, but you see these guys deadlock 49-49. So if you're looking for sort of advice as to how North Carolina is going to go in the presidential, that Senate race may make you think that Donald Trump is going to pull it out. This governor's race uh, gives us no information because this is as close as they come. Yeah. Historically, you have to win Ohio if you're a Republican. It's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Winning Ohio does put him at the edge now, possibly winning the election. However, I do think we're going to see a pattern which is traditional. Uh, the Republican, if you look at the country, it's basically divided 50-50. Uh, winning Ohio, then losing Pennsylvania makes sense tonight. We'll see if it, we'll see if it does end up making sense. One Jason. thing I will say about this Ohio call is that this is something that the Clinton campaign was prepared for. So when they were setting out their map that said, okay, we have all these more paths than the Trump campaign, it included mm -hmm. losing Ohio and losing Iowa. Yeah. So I think from that perspective, uh, this, you know, th this news should be tempered just a little bit. I think the question is still their path, don't forget, we haven't even started talking about Colorado. And there were some late questions in this race about Colorado and what the movements there uh, were going to be. Their path is Virginia, Colorado, and it's through the South. All right. Uh, speaking of Colorado, let's do some of these Senate races because the first one on our list, we've been trying to fall back and catch up with these Senate races this evening, is Michael Bennett uh, returning from Colorado, there will be um, Democratic in, incumbent there. inevitable talk about Michael Bennett um, uh, joining leadership, I think, in, in the years to come, uh, a very popular figure, uh, and, and more about Colorado as a state after this. Um, the uh, leader of the Democrats uh, projected, predicted people guess it's going to be led by Chuck Schumer of New York, uh, who uh, had an easy time returning to the Senate. We're just going to go through these. Uh, Jerry Moran in Kansas. Uh, John Hoven, North Dakota. Getting these as you're seeing them. John Thune going back to the Senate from South Dakota. He had an interesting uh, history with uh, Donald Trump during this campaign. John Boozman, Arkansas. Uh, Georgia, it's going to be Johnny Isaacson. In Iowa, the longtime KG Republican veteran Chuck Grassley going back. And uh, Mike Lee, the popular Republican, is going back from Utah. Here's the Senate again. Uh, Democrats with one net gain. But this is early. Yeah, but the, the, the Senate races that are outstanding right now are a bunch of fascinating ones. In Missouri, I believe our characterization in Missouri with Roy Blunt trying to return to the Senate, the Republican, against a Democratic challenger named Jason Kander. I believe our characterization there is that is still too early to call. I that was too early, uh, yeah. In Missouri, we do have a presidential call that Missouri has gone to Donald Trump at the presidential level. But this Senate race right now is still too early to call. Um, also, in terms of too close to call, Senate races, big names. Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania against Katie McGinty, the Democrat. That's too close to call. In New Hampshire, the Kelly Ayotte race against the Democratic governor, Maggie Hassan. That is too close to call. Um, and in Nevada, uh, we've got Joe Heck, the Democrat, excuse me, the Republican, up against Catherine Cortez Masto, who's the Democrat trying to take Harry Reid's seat there. We have also a, too close. Excuse me. We have a, have a major projection. In the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, the projected winner is Hillary Clinton.
Casey Hunt. Campaign breathing a sigh of relief there. <laughs> sure, sigh of relief. And you know, we were talking earlier, and I had this horse talking to me about, and, and forgive me for using a house race as an example here, uh, but News Barbara Comstock, you. she's a representative from Northern Virginia, mm. Fairfax yeah. area. I'm told her internal polling had her tied. And at the end of the day, she won, or she looks like she's on track to win wow. by almost 10 points with 90% of the vote in. Really? So we have been talking about what may have gone wrong here. And even if Hillary Clinton comes out on top here, it's very clear there was something uh, going on in this mm -hmm. polling. I think that's a pretty sharp example in an that's area that should have gone on. I was just way. checking that race you're talking about. It's Virginia 10, Virginia Barbara 10. Comstock, Comstock, seen as a bellwether race. Mm -hmm. yes. If she is the projected winner in that race right now, it looks like the margin is eight points in her favor. Okay. Louanne yeah. Bennett was the Democrat mm -hmm. there. Everybody yeah. thought that was going to be a squeaker. It's not. Well, the Washington, Washington Post endorsed Comstock. I think uh, you bear a bit of yeah, responsibility but, for this. Uh, but, but it seems obvious from what's happening nationwide the newspaper endorsements yeah. are not the most <laughs> <powerful>. <laughs> a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist exactly. he doesn't speak for the great lady of yeah Washington, but, but newspaper endorse you know look at all the newspapers that endorse Donald Trump right yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. like but, you know in terms of these bellwether races we're still waiting for a result on Florida Florida is obviously going to be huge mm -hmm. one of the Republican incumbents in the house who was thought to be endangered in this year of Donald Trump who definitely distanced himself from Donald Trump was Carlos Corbello the Republican Cuban American representative Representative in Florida, uh, in Florida District 26, Carlos Corbello has also won his seat tonight. He will also be returning to the to, to Congress, and so we're looking for these signs in terms of these two close to call races, uh, and we're seeing a mix up a little bit. My two word nomination for what went wrong with prediction as to actual mm -hmm. is yard signs. No one counted the yard signs, um, and I think if you see those matching glasses and mustaches, that means that's a poster. If you see them <laughs> out in public, uh, Steve Kornacki with. Um, the route to 270, which really becomes the story. There are two specific routes, two specific campaigns at this hour. Well, the question everybody's asking, I think, seeing the results come in, can Donald Trump win the presidency tonight? Let me take you through what it would take. We said it would narrow path coming into tonight. Some things are going his way. We just showed you Ohio. Now, Hillary Clinton was just called the winner in Virginia. We can add that to her column. By the way, what you're seeing here, some of these states that are lighter colors, they haven't actually been called yet for the purposes of this exercise. Exercise. We're going to expect Trump to win in Idaho. We're going to expect Clinton to win California, Oregon, Washington. Keeping that in mind, what at this point would it take for Donald Trump to get to 270? Count up with me here. Start in New Hampshire. We got a too close to call race there. Let's say Donald Trump wins New Hampshire. Take a look in Maine. Now, you got the statewide, you got the first congressional district. Uh, the first congressional district's Portland kind of Democratic. Let's say Donald Trump wins a district in Maine. In Maine, you get, a you get an electoral vote for a district. This is very rural. He's got a shot there. Take a look at Pennsylvania. Let's say Hillary Clinton holds Pennsylvania. Do we, do we have something here? Red, excuse me, should be, should be red. Let's say Hillary Clinton, see, I'm doing this on the flyer. Let's say Hillary Clinton gets Pennsylvania. Let's say Trump gets North Carolina. We see him leading down there right now. Yeah. Let's say Trump holds on in Georgia. Let's say Trump gets Florida, where he's leading right now. Look where he's steady, starting to get to. Now, let's say Hillary Clinton holds the upper Midwest here. Let's say she gets Wisconsin. Let's say she gets Minnesota. Trump in Iowa. Let's say he gets Iowa. We'll give her right now uh, Michigan. I know that's a very close state. Give that to her. Let's, let's say Donald Trump gets the one district in Nebraska. Let's give Hillary Hillary Clinton, Colorado, that's been looking Democratic. Let's say Trump gets Arizona, and look where he is, 268. And at that point, if he were to get Nevada, he'd be over 270. If he were to lose Nevada, because there were some bad early signs for him there, if he could win Michigan. 284 and winning Michigan at 284 he could even absorb a loss perhaps like if he were to somehow lose Arizona still over 270 at that point so this is the first time we can say it's very theoretical at this point things have gone Trump's way he needs some of these states to actually be called for him but there are paths to 270 that are opening up for Donald Trump as we speak who else wants to talk to John Ralston oh yeah I know mm. our buddy John well, Ralston who's the dean of the Nevada yeah. political he said Party. it was over he well, did. he said it was over based on the early vote. He right. said if you compare well, the early was, vote now, he was to the definitive. Early vote then, he was definitive. He yeah. was definitive. Well, what we've got—I mean, what we've got right now—I mean, obviously, 
North Carolina continues to be fascinating. Florida continues to be fascinating. But we still don't have calls uh, in Georgia, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania. We still have a call in Maine. Uh, so there's a lot of these states that we thought for sure we would at least know by now, and uh, and we don't. Right now, that Michigan uh, uh, number that um, that Steve Kornacki was talking about, that's so important. We've got less than a third of the vote in, in Michigan thus far, and that race considered too close to call. Donald Trump leading there, but less than a third of the vote in. Lawrence O'Donnell, I have a, I have a question for James Carville, does he agree with me? Michigan ought to re be renamed Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. How did you know what we were talking about? All <laughs> I, here, I didn't Ryan? know. Uh, we just spent a minute here on Michigan, and I think we might have an agreement on the table about just how important Michigan is. James Carville. Uh, I, look, if, if the Democrats lose in Michigan, uh, looking at Steve's map, I, I think this puppy's over. I, I mean, there, you stand by because it's, it, Michigan is is going to be really critical. I mean, it was good we helped Virginia, but we were supposed to hold. Virginia. I mean, that was just sort of necessary. I hope Chris is right about uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, North Carolina looks less than encouraging. Uh, Florida looks less than encouraging. I mean, it, the thing to come down to Michigan. Steve, Michigan. Michigan is going to decide who the president of the United States is tonight. Simple as that. Simple You've as seen that. seen the map. Uh, let's go back to where we began tonight. Florida, what do you see? Where do you think we are right now? It's very ominous for Hillary Clinton. I don't think she's going to be able to make up the ground in, in Florida. It doesn't seem to me that there's enough outstanding vote share for her to be able to come back. But I think what we've seen is a surge of rural Republican red vote. And you see that early call in Ohio, though the Clinton campaign was expecting it, that portends ominously for, for Michigan. Culturally, there's an alignment of these voters, and you're seeing them perform, I think, at a consistent level across all of these states, which is vastly exceeding expectations. And it's something that Nicole was saying earlier. You know, Donald Trump doesn't have a traditional ground game. And this is an organic surge of support that just wasn't seen, wasn't right. anticipated anticipated across the board in the predictive analysis and the models and in the polling. Yep. James, you've been on the phone to Florida. Uh, right. You're writing off Florida at this point for Clinton? Uh, I think it's very difficult. I'll, I'll be honest. It doesn't do, it doesn't do any good to, to, to kind of spin it. it, it it's closed. It, it look, right. look, looking at the map and looking what, what what's out, I just don't see that many votes in Broward. Now, they, they, I think they'll get close to 950,000 people voting. You gotta, they're going to blow way past uh, the margins there, but you know he's still getting a third. I mean, you, if you, for every hundred thousand he gets, you, you know, your margins only. You win sixty six, he wins thirty three. I mean, the margins only thirty. It, it seems to me to be very difficult. I, I would love to be wrong. I would love to crow later tonight and say that she did carry Florida. I'm with uh, I'm with Steve. The, the quickness of the Ohio call was disturbing. Not so much that we, we lost Ohio, that was a, always a real possibility, but that it, it, it came so quick. Uh, the first brink you felt yourself on tonight was Virginia. That was the first one where you said, if Hillary Clinton doesn't win Virginia, it's lost. Yes. Now we've moved to, to Michigan. Michigan. Michigan's right. the next stop on we, the must win. We thought going into the night, it, it was that he he had break. He had to do this. He had yes. to do that. It, it, it is now the Democrats have to. They, they don't have the, the, the margin. The path here is getting to be very narrow. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying that it can't be done. I'm just saying as the night goes on, the path narrows. And, and, and it's narrowed through on, on Steve's map. It's pretty clear uh, that, that Michigan is absolutely critical. Steve, who do you see with the favored map at this point? I think you have to, well, look, I think it's a 50-50 proposition mm -hmm. other than to say this, that Donald Trump had to drop a bunch of these states tonight, had, had a win. In every state that he's had a win, he's dropped. Mm -hmm. Right. He's dropped it into his column tonight. So uh, he had a tight, narrow path. You know, he, he had to pull an inside straight. He's on his way to pulling it uh, now. So we'll see in Michigan. But you, you look at these numbers in Michigan and you look at the cultural similarities, you know, between Michigan and Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think at this hour, you, you certainly can't say that, you know, she has an easy ride in the state of Michigan. Brian, tonight it's Michigan, Michigan, Michigan at this table. Lawrence and our specialists, our insiders, thank you. Uh, we have another projection. Just as we were going to sneak away to a break, we have another projection, and that is that in the state of Colorado, when all the votes are counted, Hillary Clinton will pick up nine electoral votes there. As we look at the race to 270, here's the bar chart, 168 to 131. 
Let's uh, see what this looks like in blue and red. It certainly starts a vertical for the Democrats out west. Uh, they have a known vertical in California along the Pacific Ocean. But uh, Chris Matthews, listening to those, uh, our, our colleagues in the other studio, interesting. Look, uh, there's no other word for it. But this is a surprise. And that, uh, uh, you know, I've been looking at these maps going back to whenever they started making them, and it's beginning to look like a familiar map. It's, been, it's beginning to look like a map we've gotten used to. And Colorado is more liberal than most of the West, and uh, New Mexico is more Hispanic. And uh, we're going to see uh, that logic continue. Uh, I think the patterns that we're looking at, how Northern Virginia, though, is holding strong for Hillary Clinton, and uh, not as strong as they thought, but it's going to be there. The suburbs of Philadelphia have let to be hurt. I think Pennsylvania is strongly going to go for Hillary Clinton. And the fascinating thing is that Michigan, which was picked up on the uh, radar screen of the Trump people about two weeks ago, yep. they, for people that don't seem to have all the mechanisms and apparatus of politics, they had good ears. And an airplane. Mm. Yeah, and they picked up what I said. You know, we better get out there and spend some time out there as an option to Pennsylvania because they talked Pennsylvania for months and they said, well, wait a minute, we can't do that. So now we're going to go up this other route. I mean, it's almost like the Civil War, you know, you know, Lee, General Lee looking for the place <laughs> to go up, you know, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, it's a lot like the Civil War. And we're going to take the next president to be a unifier, whoever it is. But I think that uh, the fact that Utah, uh, Nicole mentioned that Evan McMullen could screw the whole thing up by <laughs> two or three in the morning with this Zion vote, you know, going back to Utah as, a, as an LDS guy and appealing to what we used to call our favorite son sort of election yep. out there, uh, could screw the thing up because we do like to believe in this rickety system of ours actually working and actually producing a president with 270 electoral votes. We haven't had this problem what, since back when those untied uh, electors were elected back in the 60s where we actually said, what are they going to do? Uh, I do think this is... You know, punditry only goes so far, and it's yeah. based on history. Gene, yeah. it's based on history. No, I mean, we don't have a history of tonight. No, we don't. No, we don't. And <laughs> no, so, there's nothing uh, in the logbook. <laughs> um, we should have uh, known that. It, based it, on but, <laughs> you know, not just punditry, you, but the numbers. I mean, you know, the, the polling seem to indicate something yeah. that something different from what we're seeing. Right. So, we're not we're not all that far off the no, polls at this point. There hasn't been a, a there hasn't bit. been a shocker. Mm -hmm. The overall race Hard, being this yeah. close is shocking, I think, to a lot of people. But yeah. in terms of I mean Trump winning Ohio is not crazy. Hillary no, Clinton winning Virginia is not crazy. <laughs> we still don't know about North Carolina and Florida. No, we don't. We mm -hmm. haven't seen a race end up in a place that's radically different than that's the polls true. said and it would end up. But James is right. At the margin we thought Virginia would have been early in the evening and the fact that even well, actually, on the other hand, we did thought Georgia would be earlier in the evening. That's yeah. another fact. Case, can but you make I your point a, again? Okay. <laughs> uh, I just think that we should have seen this coming because the primary was so. Uh, we were so surprised. No one thought that Donald Trump was ever going to get this far. Katie Turr has been saying this over and over and over again. As long as you know she's been covering days. him. You know, I have to say that when I was out with Hillary Clinton on uh, the last week of of the campaign, not not this past weekend. This past weekend was a little bit different. But we were going from small smallish staged event to smallish staged event and at the time I thought this does not feel like covering a winning campaign in the final week and uh, you know I took some some criticism for that for, from some sources and this weekend felt like a winning campaign the president you all saw the rally on Independence Mall but you know day to day you, you drive to these events you drive past fields of Donald Trump signs it's anecdotal but it's there and I, I mean anecdotally speaking in terms of that Philadelphia event one of the things that I noticed covering that live last night was although that was an incredibly intense event in terms of the visuals and 33,000 people out in front of Independence Hall and Michelle Obama and Barack Obama and all when Hillary Clinton gave her remarks she was serious she was almost tense she did not at all seem psyched to be looking out at that huge numbers of people there was no lightness to her like relief like oh this is over and I've got right, it right. you could see it I'm not a, I'm not a body language person in terms of dealing with mm -hmm. candidates but I was so different than what I expected to see from her given the stagecraft of that evening and in fact actually the enthusiasm Enthusiasm and excitement of the president himself to then see Hillary Clinton follow him and be workaday, serious, and almost terse. Well, the, depending on the, how this ends up, though, I think the Clinton campaign could end up very, very happy that they decided to do that event in Philadelphia, yeah. Yeah. right? It's, because it's, 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 it, it, it like seems like it may shore up Pennsylvania, which they may need. I'm walking into 30 Rock tonight, a guy. I'll describe him, short and fat, yelled at me, jackass, and I yelled back something appropriate to him, okay, which I do. Uh, Friend of yours? And a real pal. <laughs> this anti, I know what, he was ginned up by the Clinton, uh, the uh, Obama thing, my Obama. 
the Trump Trump thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been going on now, this anti-media. Could it be that when people are polled by pollsters, they see as the media, this has been proffered. they don't give an answer that's straight. They just don't even give an answer. Yeah. They hang up on the person. They think they're yeah. part of that world. Mm -hmm. And this anti-media campaign of Trump's has been vicious, continual, and the heart of every rally. Well, you know, you're there. Every <laughs> rally, it's been yeah. like that against Kitty Turr, generally, who she's there. I've been there. more Clinton rallies, yeah, yeah than it, Trump it, rallies. It's part Rachel, of this mood. Just very quickly to your point, I do think Clinton is very much a workman-like candidate. That's, yeah. you know, she, and, and watching her follow the president is very striking for that reason. I do think that they were flying around this weekend convinced that they were going to win. They were celebrating in the air yeah, yeah, on concur. that airplane. I concur. That was their body language. Um, a couple of things here. We're, we're going to run to a quick break. But I wanted to show you this graphic. 56% of the national vote is in. That's the difference the between vote. them. And also down on Rachel's side, the blue graphic down there that, that doesn't look like the election graphics, that's real. That's the Dow Jones futures. We have watched it fall through the 300, 400 level. Uh, it topped wow. 700. It's back in the sixes. That's real. We'll keep an eye on that. Another break for us. We're waiting for over 10 states to close that we are uh, desperately interested in. Headquarters on the left. That's the Javits Convention Center, a sprawling structure along the Hudson River on the right. The much more modest space, the uh, ballroom inside the venerable New York Hilton on 6th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, a building visible from our building here and surrounded as are all the secure locations tonight in New York with New York City Sanitation Department dump trucks filled with sand. They have decided to use those as an impenetrable uh, barrier. Uh, Trump Tower tonight is surrounded by dump trucks. It's quite a, a sight. I Let's will also say shout out to NYPD tonight for the number of officers that they've got out oh, yeah. dealing with. I mean, the last time that we had two election night parties for the two major candidates in New York City was 1944. That's what they've got to deal with tonight in a race that has already featured a lot of misbehavior uh, by fans on both sides. And the shout out to the NYPD in terms of how much overtime they're working tonight mm -hmm. and what they've got their hands on. It's unprecedented. Put it this way, the next president of the United States is in New York City tonight. Uh, in Michigan tonight, they have a barn burner. Kevin Tibbles is live in Grand Rapids. Hey, Kevin, what do you have there? <laughs> I guess you could describe it as a barn burner. Uh, I'm actually in a pizza joint in Grand Rapids, which, of course, is Gerald Ford country. But I got to I mean, are you surprised what is going on? I am, and I love it. Why? Because Michigan is in play, and we are taking back our country. Well, I've got to, I'm going to come back to you but here, but... That is because about 45 minutes to an hour ago, people were sitting around enjoying uh, the evening, Brian. But all of a sudden, especially, you know, when they started to see the numbers come in from Ohio, for example, and then the numbers started to come in here. I've got to tell you, in Grand Rapids, they've only got about 20 percent of the votes counted, uh, but it is leaning in that direction. And now I'm going to come back to it. Uh, what does that mean, take our country back? It means ending corruption. It means loving our country. It means bringing back freedom and liberty to America and bringing back all the things that we believe in in our country. Is, is there some kind of a, as you can tell, Brian, I mean, it's a loud, raucous place. Is there some kind of a message that you're supposed to be trying to be sending to some establishment out there? No, it's just, it's just being fiscally responsible. It's taking care of America. It's ending corruption. It's draining the swamp. And, and as a woman, I have to ask you this question. You voted for Donald Trump. Yes. Why? Because Donald Trump is going to change America and bring back integrity and bring back 
America to what we need to be, where well, we need to be. What we have seen is some sort of a change seems to be taking place in Michigan tonight. And Brian, I'm sure I'll be talking to you as soon as that change, however way it goes, happens. I'll send it back to you, Brian. In the meantime, you're in the right place. Uh, stay surrounded by people, pizza, and the beverage of your choice. Kevin Tibbles in Jerry Ford's home congressional district. And right everybody, I mean, we heard James Carville and Steve Schmidt agreeing earlier this hour. Our insiders, our professionals agreeing that the, Michigan's going to decide the presidency tonight. Right now, just to check in with 45 percent of the vote in in Michigan, it's real tight, 48-47, a tiny lead for Donald Trump with just under half of the vote in. We're also keeping a very, very, very close eye on Pennsylvania. Now, Pennsylvania has a little bit less than two-thirds of the vote in. We've got 65 percent of the vote in in Pennsylvania right now. Hillary Clinton does have a lead right now in Pennsylvania. We also want to look at the other race that's outstanding right now in Pennsylvania, which is the Senate race in Pennsylvania. This has been a really interesting one to watch thus far. Pat Toomey's the Republican incumbent. He's been very cagey about his support for Donald Trump or lack thereof. He waited in until just over an hour before polls closed in Pennsylvania before he voted so he would have to admit publicly that he did in fact vote for Trump uh, but right now uh, it's too close to call in Pennsylvania you see that small lead there uh, on behalf of the Democratic challenger to incumbent Senator Pat Toomey Katie McGinty was chief of staff to the Democratic governor of Pennsylvania Tom Wolf she right now is leading Pat Toomey apparently with 64 percent of the vote in but this is too close to call Steve Kornacki is keeping a very close eye on Pennsylvania in terms of where we've got the vote in and what What's still to come, Steve? Yeah, you see the situation right now. Clinton is leading in Pennsylvania. The votes that have been counted, the gap Donald Trump is trying to make up here in the state at this moment is 116,000 votes. Now, is it possible for him to get that? Let's take a look at the big places that are in and what's left for the Democrats. They have squeezed pretty much what they are going to squeeze out of Philadelphia. Still more vote, a little bit more vote to come in. Remember, they had the big rally there. Now, the target number here, the dream number, I should say, for Democrats here would have been something approaching 490 to 500,000 in terms of the margin. That's what Obama got. He got 492. You see right now Clinton's lead is sitting there closer to 400,000. They still feel they can win the state at 400,000, but it gets dicier at that point. Here's something that's a bit of a surprise. The suburbs of Philadelphia, we talked so much about college-educated white voters, suburbs of Philadelphia. This is going to be big for Hillary Clinton this year. Well, she's leading in them. You can see it's all blue around here, but let me take you through it. Look at the margin in bucks, 49-47. That's pretty much unchanged from what we saw four years ago. That's not a huge shift to Hillary Clinton. There's a slight shift in Montgomery County. I think this was closer to about 17 points four years ago. You can see in Chester, this one was a little closer four years ago. There's been movement here. But again, this is not overall. This is about what Delaware came in at. This is not overall that dramatic a shift. Also, Pittsburgh basically in right now. The reason Donald Trump would still have some life in Pennsylvania uh, looking at the votes to come in. You see a lot of places that are red. York County running up the score here. You got vote there. You've got vote Vote that's still going to come in in Butler County, so there are some red areas left out here. Clinton leading. All right, Steve Kornacki, did you have a? <laughs> Clinton's leading. I, I, I look at those county results. I mean, they're still to, uh, talking about getting 450 out of Philadelphia, not 400,000. But, you know, uh, that's a hell of a majority. And, and Jack Kennedy carried that city by 330, Humphrey by 450. There's a tradition of that kind of plurality coming out of the city. But it's been, a, as Steve points out, the huge difference is the, the suburbs used to be moderate Republican. Uh, they were New York Herald Tribune Republicans, Rockefeller Republicans. They don't exist anymore. Nor does that the New whole, York Herald Tribune. Right, the Herald Tribune yeah. went. The whole idea of a moderate Republican from the Northeast, like Bill Scranton, Ro Nelson Rockefeller, Christine, uh, uh, Christine, Todd Whitman, Todd Whitman, you know, they, 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 from Jersey, there was this long pattern of well to do in many cases, Republican moderates uh, in that part of the country. And they're gone. Yeah, and I that's could, why the burbs are dead. Lowell Weicker, Mac Lowell Matthias, Weicker, keep exactly going. Exactly those people. Um, another break. Our last break before the top of the hour, 11 o'clock poll closings. If anything happens, we'll break out.
the next poll closings at 11 o'clock Eastern, at the top of the hour, just a few minutes from now, we're going to have poll closings in California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Hawaii. Um, at this point, this is the point of the race where everybody who looks back on having covered previous presidential races says, oh, yeah, by the time we called Hawaii, it's not like we didn't know what was going to be happening. We have no idea what's going to be happening right now at this point um, of all of the swing states that you could possibly uh, be watching. Anybody who had a list of swing states right now, the only ones that are decided are Virginia for Hillary Clinton, Colorado for Hillary Clinton, New Mexico uh, for Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump uh, winning Ohio. Those are the projections in terms of NBC News. But in terms of outstanding states, we are still w waiting for results on Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, um, and Nevada. Chris, you've been sort of doing your own reporting on yeah, the Pennsylvania uh, prospects. I just talked to the chairman of the Democratic City Committee. He is basically, to use the old term, boss of the city. And they're still expecting to get between 420 and 440,000 and maybe up to 450. So they're still meeting their quota, which has always been enough to carry the state. Where there has been a flattening out of expectations has been the suburbs. They've certainly, the fact that Hillary Clinton has carried all four suburban counties is history. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she's done it uh, not so well is the surprise and the question mark for the state. My, my, my surmise is they're still going to carry the state, but not dramatically. We're also, we're also looking at Michigan. Michigan appears to be very, very tight right now. We've got a little bit less than half of the vote in. Trump appears to be in the lead, 49-46. But again, that's with less than half of the vote in. Steve Karnacki, do you have any intel for us on Michigan right now? Yeah, we could take you through where the vote still has to come in. The margin here for Donald Trump sitting, you know, about 57,000 votes. That's what Hillary Clinton's got to make up. Obviously, the best thing for Democrats here, if you're looking for good news, if you're a Democrat and you're looking in Wayne County, this is where Detroit is. This is a place that cast something on the order of uh, 800 some odd thousand votes four years ago. So you can see there is a lot of vote to come in and wane. The other thing I can tell you is early on we had numbers here that showed a much closer race. It seems like the suburban parts of Wayne County reported first. So the city of Detroit now may be the heart of what's to come in. So Hillary Clinton, you can expect she's going to get a lot of votes out of Wayne. Also next door still votes to come in. This is where Ann Arbor University of Michigan is. If you're Donald Trump, though, check this out. We talked about earlier, Macomb County. Macomb County produced a total of 400,000 votes four years ago. You can see a lot of vote to come in Macomb. This is a big reversal. This was a Democratic county in 2008, a Democratic county in 2012. This is looking like a Trump county by double digits tonight. So that is a shift in favor of the Democrat, excuse me, in favor of the Republicans. Here's another one we might be looking at. We talk about these characteristics of Michigan. Saginaw was Obama country four years ago. Trump leading there right now. So we're seeing the map change a little bit. In Michigan. Steve Karnacki looking tight at Michigan right now, as, as everybody is right now. Uh, there's a lot of states that are still outstanding, but we're starting to key in on which of the ones are essentially forks in the road for these little, these little paths that either of the candidates might have. At this point, each of the candidates has a path that's more like a deer track through light brush. Neither of them has a yellow brick road that you can see from space, right? These are pretty narrow paths that each of them are going to be following, uh, and that's why um, individual states like Michigan may end up being the thing that everybody in the country is watching today. and channeling our old friend Tim Russert who we always miss especially on nights like this we have all vowed to rename Michigan temporarily just by saying it three times Michigan 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 given its importance tonight here are our 11 p.m. poll closings there they are in gold we've gone all the way out west and here we go up the side of the building in the Golden State in California the projected winner is Hillary Clinton. Note the electoral vote, votes, 55. In the state of Washington, Hillary Clinton, the projected winner. In the state of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, Hillary Clinton, the projected winner. In the state of Hawaii, four electoral votes, Hillary Clinton, the projected winner. In Idaho, interesting race, as we've been saying, Donald Trump, the predicted winner, four electoral votes. Here is the bar graph to 270. <laughs> Here is the math. Right now, Hillary Clinton, 209 to Donald Trump's 172. More on that as we continue. Here are the states we continue to watch. Too close to call, and these are some big ticket items. Florida, Pennsylvania, Georgia, one of the first states to close tonight. Here we still are. Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. North Carolina, 15 electoral votes. Minnesota with 10. 
Iowa, still too close to call. Nevada, still too close to call. Ditto New Hampshire. And the state of Maine, which we have moved from too early to too close, with not even half the raw vote in. Now, the list of states we are characterizing too early to call. Arizona, Wisconsin, and Utah. Hmm. Let's take a look at the Reds and the Blues down on home ice. In this road to 270, unmistakable color patterns, but a West Coast bulwark with this 11 p.m. Eastern time poll closing for Hillary Clinton. It's interesting. At this we, poll closing, this is the first one where we've had all of the races called. We had no too, clo no too close, no too early in the races that just closed right now at 11 o'clock. Also, no surprises. Had any of these been a surprise, it would have been seismic. But yes, Idaho is going to be red. The whole West Coast is going to be blue, including uh, the island state of Hawaii. We only have one state left to close now, which is Alaska. Uh, that's the only state outstanding in terms of its poll closing. We're we're just waiting on states that are too early uh, and too close to call. Let's go to a Senate call on the wall here in the studio, and that's Ron that's Johnson big one. going oh. back for the Republicans. The Democrats were quite confident that Mr. Feingold sure. Uh, sure. would be going back to the U.S. Senate. And uh, Chris, what's the quote you've been using all night? But you can't go home again. You can't go home again. I think Feingold would have been a big surprise. I think historically he would have been the first person to defeat the person who beat him when he had the office. That's, he would have been. That's right. And But I have to tell you, as, as most of us have been tracking this potential for the Democrats to win back the Senate, we began it with Illinois, which they've won. They've, they've beaten yep. Kirk out there. Duckworth won. And this was the second easiest. Everyone said this is the second easiest. And the third easiest was going to be Indiana. That was going to be an easy Maybe pickle. Pennsylvania. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, well, then, then, of course, we got the two or three outstanding now. So it's very much up in the air. Now they needed four, net four pickup to win, and the Democrats did. And yet, the, the thing about that, I do have values besides my horse race interest in this. I do know certain senators who are solid enough to stay there in normal circumstance. Kelly Ayotte, much more hawkish for my taste, but a solid senator, an impressive senator. If she holds on, that shows she's got the stuff in this kind of uh, win condition up there. But I think clearly this thing's up in the air now. They have to, uh, uh, they didn't knock off Burr. Russ didn't win. Yep. Uh, but they didn't knock off. Uh, they didn't pick up the, the vote in uh, Indiana. They didn't pick it up now in Wisconsin. They picked it up in Illinois. But they're just beginning this climb, and there are not many options left. I think they now have to win the other ones we're talking about, New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. And Nicole. Missouri's also still out there. too early call, to call at this point. Yeah. That's going to be one Please. interesting race between the old pro, as you said you said earlier, he's yeah. been around forever, and a guy who has all these Washington connections, a real leadership type, and uh, up against this guy, Kander, who knows how to lock and load a gun yeah, and with his made, blindfold on. You know, military more, intelligence officer. Yeah. Yeah. More fascinating ads of this cycle. But as you he, see there, I mean, it's too early to call less than 40% in, but Blunt uh, has a pretty big lead in terms of, in terms of the, the vote that's in already. New Hampshire and Kelly, Kelly Ayotte's race, that's very We have a to, projection. Right, we'll Donald Trump is being awarded North Carolina. Whoa. Mm. Well, that's a pitch. Just came in 15 electoral votes. This makes all kinds of different paths even more interesting. There's the electoral race, 209-187. Here it is in color. We're going to have to start talking about the, the, the deer tracks again, the paths <laughs> to do 70 at this point. It's still contiguous. It's still contiguous. It's all red together. Though. Well, that's yeah, if you're going to hike it, that's useful. Together. But in terms of who's going to be president, I want to know the numbers. Together. Hey, Lawrence O'Donnell, I want to hear from James Carville. We've got James Carville and Mike Murphy here. And James, you were already discounting North Carolina for the right, Clinton yeah, campaign. Right. Uh, you're not going to win Virginia narrowly and carry North Carolina. That's and as happen. we were watching this last group of returns, mm -hmm. it was actually 
actually one of the Senate races that got your attention yeah. more than these presidential r right. returns right Wisconsin. now. And that's Wisconsin. Right. What did you uh, see? Uh, what I, what, we called Ron Johnson easy yeah. early in Wisconsin, which tells me that the path for Hillary Clinton and the Democrats in Wisconsin is going to be pretty narrow. Uh, the math in Michigan, uh, Mike and I were just doing some sort of back of the envelope calculations. I can I can see a way that she can she can win Michigan, but uh, you know, we, we, look, every domino has to fall now. Yeah, Michigan's yeah. super close, but there's a lot of Detroit left to come. If it's normal and, and some Genesee County, which is Flint and Washtenaw, Ann Arbor, Trump's doing well out state, but a lot of it is in. So she's in the hunt in Michigan. It's tight. Right. But we're, we're looking at that saying, hey, if Detroit's rolling worth 300000 again, you know, it's starting to look like she's in the hunt there. And then we hear Ron Johnson, who is considered the second most vulnerable Republican, has won pretty comfortably in Wisconsin. That indicates that the drama may be moving to Wisconsin. So for the scorecards at home, if the Clinton campaign takes Michigan, the next thing to watch is Wisconsin. Yeah, absolutely. And it's Wisconsin could be uh, what breaks it or, or right. makes it for the Clinton campaign. It, it, yeah. it, it, right. It, it looks like the Republicans may, you know, may retain the Senate. If Trump wins the presidency, the Democratic Party will have the least amount of power that I can ever remember the political party having, both at the national level and, yeah. and the state level. It, 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 it's hard to, to overestimate <laughs> what this means. Tonight and, and how nervous Wisconsin. I am. We haven't carried Wisconsin since '84, so he's turning the map a little upside down in some ways here. Yeah. If it happens, yeah, if it happens, yeah, yeah, you know, let's be clear. That, I want to be very clear that there's a way that, that the Democrats can win the presidency. I want to be clear about yes. that. But but the, again, a lot of the, now the dominoes have to start falling our way. All right, we're back to you, Brian. All right, Lawrence O'Donnell, thanks. Steve Kornacki over at the board. Let's talk paths here, Steve. Yeah, let's take a look at, at exactly what it would take, what they were just talking about there for Donald Trump. So you see the scoreboard right now with the new updates. So let's take you through a couple scenarios here. We've shown you it's not been called, but Donald Trump is leading in Florida right now. Georgia, it's not been called. But again, if Donald Trump were to get these two states, New Hampshire, this is too close to call right now. It is winnable for Trump. There is this congressional district, this rural congressional district in Maine. It's very winnable for Donald Trump. Let's leave Michigan and Wisconsin alone for a second and let's go to Arizona, the next most likely target for Trump. Again, if he wins Arizona, look where he's. Oh, and by the way, there's this one congressional district in Omaha. Again, if he wins that, then look where he's sitting. There's, these are the most winnable states left for him, and he's sitting at 268, and he would be one state away from the presidency. Now, we're talking about Michigan. You got a lot of Democratic vote to come in in Michigan, Trump leading by about 40,000 votes right now. You got Wisconsin. You still have votes to come in from Milwaukee. You still have votes to come in from the county where we were Madison. And those, those are Democratic areas of the state. However, we are also seeing a lot of rural counties that are traditionally blue flip to red in Wisconsin. I can show you that in a minute, but Wisconsin, right now, that's why it's too close to call, and Nevada. That would be the third target. Donald Trump, if the other things I just showed you go his way, he needs to win one of these. He needs to win Nevada, or he needs to win Wisconsin, or he needs to win Michigan. If he does that, he's president-elect. All right. Let's talk about it. Nicole Wallace. Listen, I have been hearing for the last hour that Republicans are giddy about the prospect of controlling all three branches mm -hmm. of power, which is what a lot of Republicans, sure. even Trump... Uh, detractors think is within reach tonight. Um, I've also heard from my Trump-loving parents who said, if you're lucky, Trump won't deport you. I'm not so sure. I think Steve Schmidt, <laughs> Mike Murphy, and I, if we go missing after here, like maybe have the Middle East right. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm near the top of it. Uh, but, but, you know, we just had Bill McIntyre on uh, across the hall, and, and all of the polls were wrong. This, she did not have a 3.5 point lead going into this morning, and that's what the average of polls have her at. This mm -hmm. is not a map that reflects no. a three-point a three point lead. She, she no. didn't have that. I don't know that she ever had it. People will, will uh, I think the, the Clinton camp is already sort of putting out this Comey spin, and it's half of the story, but, but the other half is what it did to him. He closed stronger than anyone in recent political history, and our folks that were on the trail with him talked about it. The New York Times wrote an incredible piece about how it was this thunderbolt that just got him on message. He made a closing argument that is being reflected in the exit polls about being an outsider in a year when you like no one you pick 
Mm. The known unknown, not the known, no, I don't like her. You pick the, I don't know if I don't like him. Mm -hmm. And that's what they picked. They picked, you know, I know I don't like her. I don't know how much I don't like him. And, and the closing argument from the Clinton campaign, this is about what kind of country you live in, is something every, every parent is going to have to grapple with because mm -hmm. this is the country we live in where the disgust, right. I think 10 months ago I called him Politico political chemo who wipes out all the healthy blood cells yeah. who takes out everything with him because yeah. people think the disease is so acute they're willing to take the strongest medicine possible I think that's what we are seeing what? the cancer was Washington and and a lot more people than we predicted than our pollsters predicted viewed but then him as why, the cure why aren't any incumbents losing well you know George W Bush campaigned for I think every Republican who won tonight on the board and his message was anti-protectionism anti-isolationism and anti-nativism okay. so voters are really smart and I think they've calculated that at the top they want change but it can't but, be that but how is that smart if you want if you're if you're voting for two, two different problem. things I'm right return all I mean, of Congress you're voting yeah. for you know, two then, then why is she things? winning and listen it is far more just, likely at this mm -hmm. point that he wins than she wins it is far more likely at this point that you know and I say this not as someone who voted for him but it is far more likely that he wins well, and it is well, far more likely that tomorrow morning we're talking about a Trump cabinet than a Clinton cabinet. That's I'm not disputing that. What I'm disputing is that the diagnosis mm -hmm. is that people wanted to get rid of Washington. Because if well, they wanted to get rid of Washington, the ticket, they would have thrown out they had Ron a Johnson. They well, she'd thrown, been there you know, 30 years. I think at the top, they they viewed her as less appealing than him. I'm, I'm looking at the same polls. Yeah, but you it's are, not right? it's so, not a diagnosis for the rest of the for the rest of what happened mm -hmm. tonight. I think, and which I think is a fascinating thing. I don't know what it means that the Republican Party survives intact, and the only thing that changes is a radically different type of person oh, at the top. I am not. I'm not saying it's intact. Else I am not saying it's intact. What Paul Ryan and becomes, Paul Ryan and Jim Comey, two Republicans, become like the last dinosaurs tomorrow morning. They become the most endangered species in the country. Because I'm Trump's going to try to throw you Ryan think out. Donald Trump wants to work with the Speaker Ryan. He may say so tonight, and if he wins in a victory speech, Paul Ryan is is endangered. He had the most uncomfortable and really excruciating endorsement of Donald Trump. There's, I mean, if, if Trump wins, I think he wants a Speaker that's going to go along with his. But he's going to get in there and be like, "Vengeance yeah, is mine." John McCain, you're me. dead. I don't John think the party's intact. I, I, I'm only half joking about no. getting deported myself. It's not intact, but it has, at, a, at, at the level of our voters and our base, it has embraced change hmm. over stability. And what strength. does the new party call itself? <laughs> you know, right. like, like, I keep thinking of you know Prince, the band formerly known as I don't know. You know it's still the, the party just, formerly known as the Republicans. Had they thrown out more people running for Congress and running for the Senate? I would think that the Republican Party was going to be radically different. Instead, I think they just swapped out the guy at the top. Everybody else goes back. He's I mean, just not safe. any guy, well, it's though. It's a pretty I mean, radical, radical change radical. at the top, though. Yep. It, yes. it is. Very. And, and so, you know, I mean, one of the questions I think uh, we would be asking if this went that way is, um, to, you know, where do you draw the line pro-Trump, anti-Clinton, uh, you know, in, in terms of right. how people you know, voted and why they voted that we way? Have a, we have a, a poll we um, take here at NBC Wall Street Journal, which guy Jack Germont believed in his religion over the years. It's the right direction, wrong direction yeah. question. It's not ideological. It can mean we were too far left. We can mean we we're too far right. You have to read it the way you read it. But it's been pretty consistently two-thirds. We don't like the direction of this country. And so we tried as a country. We picked hope, a big poster. No, wait, I was for that all the way. Of course, I'll admit it. And we're looking all the time for change. We made changes in 08. We made a change in 10. Right? We made mm -hmm. more of a change in 14. We're maybe making a change in 16. The president had a tremendous bond with this candidate for presence of the Democratic Party. I've never seen a closer bond. Mm. She's my candidate. He's my president. Let's get together. We're going to do this. Well, it's not working tonight, so clearly. It's certainly not clear yet well, who's going to win. A very but I do think rating. there's tremendous response to that wrong direction number, mm -hmm. that people keep trying to find the president they want, and they keep hoping. The Bernie crowd. This guy, Bernie, wasn't going to be president, but it was pushing that button. Yeah. I want change. Everybody yeah. was pushing that button who voted for Bernie. He didn't make and it. And people who like Trump liked Bernie as a second choice. They, they want that change. They're banging on the pipes, more hot water, whatever they're saying. They want <laughs> something. Like the kid says, I want an no item. Doubt. I want in, a thing. In yeah. Bernie stand, in Bernieville, a Vermont Republican has just been elected governor. Well, maybe that's so how you <laughs> I just think that there's, a, there's an urge for something we don't have. Yeah. And if Trump wins, I think it will be the toughest job in history for him to deliver what he promised. Right. If Hillary wins, she has to deal as an establishment figure, the first woman president, with a need to try to bind this country together and keep it workable for four years. And that means dealing with 
who has ever left on the Republican side. Across our newsroom, uh, Hugh Hewitt, we've had many discussions with you, Hugh, over uh, uh, this campaign season. Um, we have them all on video. Uh, so uh, what, what do you make of what you're witnessing? Well, I am uh, perhaps the only admitted reluctant Trump voter in the building. And so I'm happy to explain, I think there are millions of people like me, people who are worried about the Supreme Court. I think Obamacare is the untold story here. I think it just clobbered people in Wisconsin and in Pennsylvania. That's why Ron Johnson won. I had him on my radio show this morning talking about Obamacare. I think the Republicans are holding the Senate because there is a promise of the repeal and replacing of Obamacare. And, and while I understand Nicole's concerns, I don't share them. I think think that what you will see with Donald Trump is a completely disruptive change force. There will be a drop in the market tomorrow. It will come back and he will surround himself with Mike Pence's and they will not throw out Paul Ryan. He will want to accomplish things. He's a builder. He is a very different personality than we've dealt with before. But for all those reluctant Trump voters out there who came home in the last uh, two weeks, and I'm one of them, uh, we're feeling as though it's a policy election, and it's a rejection of Secretary Clinton's ethics. That's what it comes down to. Hugh Hewitt uh, will uh, we'll continue to knock this around here in this room. We're going to fit in a break. We are covering to call it a fluid situation at the presidential level is an understatement. Uh, we'll be right back. We are back. These are the faces in the crowd. That is the Jacob Javits Convention Center on the west side of Manhattan along the Hudson River. Uh, we showed the uh, the overflow uh, room earlier uh, before the actual crowd had been loaded in. There was a story in the New York tabloids that was knocked down just a few days ago about the fireworks, the victory fireworks celebration that was planned for tonight over the Hudson River until cooler, calmer and more reasonable heads prevailed within the Clinton campaign and they stopped the fireworks two or three days ago. Uh, Stop the plans for the fireworks. At yeah. Least. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's the situation we're looking at. Steve Kornacki is at the board talking about Wisconsin. Steve, what have you found? Yeah, I mean, look, we're talking about Wisconsin, one of these states. If it, if it comes to the scenario where things break Trump's way the way they are in states he's leading, this could be one of those that puts him over the top. He is leading right now by 60,000 votes. Now, where are the votes left? There are votes left in Milwaukee County where Clinton Clinton's winning big. There's probably a little bit more than 100,000 votes left here. Again, depends on turnout. Could be a little bit more. Clinton will pick up votes here. She will also pick up votes in Dane County. There were 300,000 votes that were cast here in 2012. You can see they've still got probably another 100,000 votes or so out. Clinton will make up significant ground here. Here's the problem, though. Also out, look at this. La Crosse County. This is just starting to come in. Trump leading here, and Trump's leading all around here. Trump's going to pick up ground here. Here's a shocker. Brown County, we're Green Bay is. This was an Obama county. Donald Trump's winning this thing by 20 points, and it's only half in. He's going to pad his margin here. You want the story of Wisconsin? You want the story of the Rust Belt? You want really the story of America in a lot of ways? Check out this map, this red-blue map as we see right now, and look at the sea of red in Wisconsin, a state that last voted for a Republican 32 years ago in 1984. What did this look like just four years ago? Look at all that red in the Obama election four years ago. Look all that blue. Donald Trump has taken, and a lot of these are very small counties, Donald Donald Trump has taken them and he's turned them red tonight in Wisconsin. Could be going, could be going Republican for the first time in 32 years. Wow. I, I, I want to uh, just talk about one factor here that we haven't discussed at all over the course of this evening, which is in some of these uh, states, I've been looking specifically at some of the states where Trump is leading, uh, even if we don't have a call in those states, just these very close states, and Wisconsin among them. There are a number of these states in which the third party balloting, the third party vote is a factor uh, in terms of the size of the margin here between Trump and Clinton. Again, you can't always say that every third party vote uh, came from one major party ticket or another. But in Florida, which we have not called, in New Hampshire, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Iowa, in all of these places, the numbers that you're seeing for the third party more than account for the difference between the two candidates. And so if those 
states end up getting called with these very tiny margins, you may see that the Gary Johnson vote is what made the difference, that the, the Gary Johnson and Jill Stein vote is what made a difference. And I'm not just talking about Utah, uh, which is a very interesting three-way race. I'm talking about the state of Florida. I mean, there's depending on where those votes came from, um, a lot of Democrats may be looking at Gary Johnson and seeing Ralph Nader there. Yep. Hmm. Not a pretty picture for them. Well, it's, it is what it is. We'll go into this eyes wide open. If you, if you vote for somebody who can't win for president, it means that you don't care who wins for president. That's what I think. And I, when you talk to people like that and say, why are you uh, letting the vote go against the interests you normally support? And they act like it's some uh, sort of a Vichy thing, you know, like you're not really taking sides mm -hmm. or something. Some kind of, I should use that term, but some kind of neutrality. Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. A neutrality. And even Switzerland was a pro-German neutrality. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you, you really do take sides. I mean, what side are you on is a pretty good question. Uh -huh. The union guys always ask that. What side are you on? Mm -hmm. And I think people don't like being making decisions because then you're responsible for who wins. But, but and then, then, then people don't want that responsibility. Oh, there's some flaws with Hillary. I'm not really sure I like her. All right, make a decision. Uh, I think some of the Republicans, however, if this is what happens tonight, went home the last two weeks and said, I care more about a conservative Supreme Court than I care about a guy with moral problems as president. I'll live with Donald Trump. Anybody, the yeah. But the idea that you look at Donald Trump and you think, hmm, Manhattan billionaire, I know, thrice but that, married. No, but he'll five, give you the Supreme Court you want. Maybe he will. Well, they, they hope he will. He's also, he will. He's also promised to build a wall on the southern border and, and to ban all Muslims from and coming into the country. And punish women who have abortions. Why do we believe some of these yeah. things and not some of the others? Well, because they're hopeful. Well, they're hopeful. Yeah. Hope is a word for it. Delusion is another. No, I don't know because well, we don't yeah. know what, who Trump is. I, I think a no, good no. argument could be made that of the three issues he ran on, illegal immigration, loss of factory jobs through bad trade deals, and wars he opposed, he may not have a commitment to any of those. How do we know? He's they never were brilliant marketing decisions, though. Brilliant marketing because they tapped into real feelings out there that people really have, and he tapped into them. Joy we'll Reed. see. We'll Joy see. Reed. I, I was just going to say on the really quickly on the um, third party vote because if you talk to particularly younger voters who were choosing third party, it wasn't even not wanting to make a decision. There was sort of a, a chic to saying I'm above both of those candidates, mm. and I think we have to own a little bit in the media uh, ourselves. This idea that we sort of equalized, not us for sitting here at this table, but in generally and broadly, the idea that these were two equally uh, flawed, equally unpopular, sort of two sides of the same bad coin Who did that? candidates. I think in Give general, the portrayal. Did that. Every story, if you Google stories of Hillary Clinton, the term trustworthiness, honesty and trustworthiness was in the story. It was sure. in every story. Every story, right? Whether or not the story itself had to do specifically with that. And I think that resonated with a lot of younger voters in particular who had a sort of a vague feeling a cool that cynicism. she was just yeah. as bad. And so the idea of there was a chic to saying, well, both of those two candidates are so bad that I'm going to take this sort of high road of picking one of the others, even if they didn't know anything about them. I mean, mm. you know, I have my two kids, I have two that are old enough to vote, who had friends that were like, I don't like either one. And they didn't know anything about Jill Stein or Gary Johnson, but they were sort of a chic to saying, I'll choose this third yeah. option. But to your point, um, Rachel, that margin in Florida, you're talking about over 200,000 votes combined for those candidates. Mm -hmm. So it actually, you are making a decision. It, it yeah. could flip the election. Oh, yeah. And on the question of Donald Trump and what it is he believes in, you know, I think one of the things that we know he believes in for certain is is revenge. So if you're, if you are Paul Ryan or Hillary Clinton or so smart, we know he believes in that. that. Yeah. He has a list. Deeply. He has a list so, so, so one thing you can count on is that, you know, given Sports all of that power and all of yeah. those powerful agencies with which you can seek revenge. In terms of Paul Ryan and the revenge factor, we've actually heard from Paul Ryan tonight. Paul Ryan was re-elected to his own seat in Congress tonight, but we've also heard from him on the broader state of the race. Chris Hayes has that. Chris? Yeah, Paul Ryan uh, has been re-elected and he has uh, uh, addressed supporters. He, of course, will be returning as of now as the Speaker of the House, although it's going to be a very uncertain future for him uh, should Donald Trump uh, emerge victorious tonight. We do know, as you said, that Donald Trump believes in revenge. It's it's one of his sort of core beliefs. He's stated it often. You hit me, I hit you back. Uh, here's Paul Ryan talking to his supporters in Janesville with his fingers crossed.
I am so eager to get back to work for you, to get on with our fixing our country's problems. We have so much potential in this country, so much potential. And if we can just tap it, that's what's ahead of us. You know, by some accounts, I've just been sitting there watching the polls. By some accounts, this could be a really good night for America. This could be a good night for us. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Break in Republicans' way the rest of the night. Uh, they could, they have a very realistic possibility tomorrow of controlling all three, both the House, the Senate, and uh, the White House. And the question would then, then become, who's in the driver's seat on policy? What does the Trump administration look like? Is it a version of Paul Ryanism, of course, a person who supported tree, free trade deals, including the TPP in the past, Mike Pence, who voted for NAFTA? Is it Trumpism? Is it something in between? Is it something out of left field? Remarkably, we sit here tonight with not a very good idea at all of what that looks like. Chris Hayes at our news desk tonight. Thank you. I would say, say uh, can we just put up that bug that we had up there just a moment ago, the Dow bug that we had? One of the things that Chris was reporting on earlier, which you've been keeping an eye on over the course of Dow really the futures. end of this campaign, um, we've been watching the markets react. Um, whenever Donald Trump appears to uh, pip up in the polls right now. And tonight, uh, you see the Dow Jones futures. Obviously, the Dow Jones is closed right now. The market is not closed in the United, is not open in the United States. These are futures, people betting on what's going to happen, or people putting their, uh, state, making their stakes in terms of what's going to happen at market opening. Down nearly 700 points tonight uh, with Donald Trump having such a better night than a lot of people thought he would. The Dow futures were not on the minds of the people who have turned vast stretches of our our country read this evening. We have a call, the state of Florida. What we are terming the apparent winner, Donald Trump. In the state of Florida, 29 electoral votes, the apparent winner terminology. Here is the electoral math, 216 Trump. 209 Clinton, the race for 270. Here's how it plays out visually. So much talk about the paths to 270. Who merely wanted Florida? And right now, in, who needed it? We have another call back to back. Utah, Trump, six electoral votes. The projected winner in Utah. Here we go. 222, 209. Back down to the ice we go for the depiction in color. Red and blue. Well, still connects. And the remaining gray. In terms of the um, swing states tonight and how they have gone, um, we've got Hillary Clinton, just in terms of swing states and battlegrounds tonight, prevailing in Virginia, in Colorado, in New Mexico. We've got Donald Trump prevailing, according to NBC News projections, uh, Donald Trump prevailing in North Carolina, Ohio, and Florida. I need to interrupt with another one. Trump wins Iowa, the projected winner in Iowa. We've had a flurry of projections here. Six more electoral votes for Donald Trump this evening, 228 to 209. Uh, again, the number that you're going for here is 270. That's the number of electoral votes that you need in order to uh, win the presidency. Steve Kornacki has just run over to the map because of Michigan. Steve? Yeah, well, we've been telling you, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, these three states emerging as key. Hillary Clinton playing catch up in Michigan. Where does it stand right now? It's tightened. Hillary Clinton polling within 17,000 votes of Donald Trump in Michigan. Let me show you where the votes are left here. If, she, if she's to make that up, first of all, take a look in Wayne County. This is where Detroit is not just Detroit. There's also some suburbs. You see, there's a lot of votes still to come in in Wayne County. Over 800,000 votes were cast here four years ago. You see, you add that up. We're really only at about the halfway point if you're using 2012 uh, as a benchmark. So Hillary Clinton can get votes out of there. There are still, though, votes to come out of Macomb County. Again, this was an Obama County. This is one Trump targeted. And look, he has turned it around. There are still votes coming out of here. He can make up some of the margin there. He's also doing surprisingly well. Again, this was an Obama County. Trump appears to 
have flipped it. This is something we saw in Wisconsin as well. So there are Trump areas as well. And if you just look at this, like we did in Wisconsin, look at all the red on this map right now in Michigan as the returns come in. Go back to 2012. You saw these blue areas. It's not quite as dramatic as Wisconsin, but you're seeing it. So Hillary Clinton has opportunities, and you see the votes have changed again. She's 25,000 behind. There are opportunities really in Wayne County and a little bit in Ann Arbor for her to make that up. If she can check Michigan off, then she can get, if she were to get Wisconsin and Nevada, that would stop Trump. Steve Karnacki, right now, what's the total amount of the vote that's in, in Michigan? We're not yet up to 60% of that vote. Yeah, and it's it's tough to, uh, yes, we're at about 60%. And again, the, the big sort of thing that's lagging right here, it's Wayne, it's, it's Detroit. You've really got about half the vote here in, by far the largest county. So this is the biggest thing yet to come in. But then it's that, a big sort of Democratic county versus a lot of small and medium-sized, what tonight are red counties, where, you know, one by one, he can chip away at that. Steve Karnacki, thank you. Again, just for to, in keeping in mind what's still outstanding in terms of NBC News projections, Georgia, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, all key states where we are waiting uh, on, the final, on the final word. And uh, there, are, there are obvious combinations of those remaining few states uh, that tell us who the next president will be. I just got word that Pennsylvania looks strong for the Democrats. Again, uh, Brady's saying out of the Philadelphia machine is going to be 450 to 460. So that's way up where he needed to get. So I, I think that state's good for Clinton right now. But if Trump's got to decide what kind of a president he's going to be, we're in a weird, weird situation right now. Oh, we're, I can confirm we're in a weird, we're in a weird situation yeah. right now. <laughs>